Good morning, friends. It is good to be back with you. I trust you had a blessed Christmas season and that your new year has gotten off to a good start. And it's definitely my goal that these devotions would be part of that good start, part of the blessing that I can bring to you if the Lord so chooses. Because as we learned in Sunday's message, it is only through our reliance upon the Lord, being connected with him as tightly and as thoroughly as possible, even as Christ says that he is the vine and we are the branches, it is only in that way that we will experience the abundant life that he came to deliver to his people through salvation and sanctification. Because our focus this past Sunday was on the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, and we saw how the majority of that book simply records the words of King Solomon. But those words are from Solomon at a time in his life when he was quite distant from God in his thinking. While he retained great wisdom, that wisdom had become disconnected from the true and full wisdom of God's own revelation. And as such, we admitted that Solomon had much to offer us in terms of accurate observations concerning the struggles and difficulties of this life, in this world, life under the sun, as he put it. But due to his disconnect from God, we recognize also that while he understood the struggles, while he saw the problems that face us, he was not rightly expressing the solution to those problems. Rather than pointing people to trust in the Lord and have faith in the Lord, who will indeed make all things new, will make all things right in the end, Solomon just sank into despair, even going so far as to say it would be better to have never been born at all. And I'd like to go to one passage in particular that demonstrates both sides of what we see from Solomon in this way. Both the side where he actually hits on some good, useful wisdom for our consideration, stuff that we can apply to our own lives, as long as we understand the other side of the situation, the side where he is still missing the ultimate conclusion, which is, of course, having to do with God himself being the source of all that is good and the solution to every problem. So with that in mind, I'll take you to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, where Solomon declares, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Now, this is by far my favorite passage of what we have from Solomon in this book, because even though Solomon himself doesn't go quite far enough in his conclusion, again, we shouldn't be surprised that he does fundamentally miss the mark. At the same time, he does point us in a good direction to begin with because he opens the section by saying that the best thing that he can think of is simply the fact that people are able on occasion to enjoy the stuff they work so hard for. And this is the goal, really the only goal that Solomon sees in life. And that in and of itself shows how disconnected from ultimate reality Solomon had become because he's still utterly focused on this life. But that's where he's at, saying that the best thing that can happen is that we are able to enjoy our daily lives, to eat and drink and be merry, the few days of his life that God had given him, as he as he concludes. Which again just points to the fact that you're going to die in the end anyway. Solomon is constantly pointing out the fewness of our days. Even when there's sort of a bright patch here, and he talks about, yeah, being able to enjoy, you know, the fruits of your labor. He, he just constantly draws our attention back over and over again that death awaits us all regardless of anything else. So this is where Solomon is falling, ashort, falling short again, despite his wisdom. He's not taking God, God's judgment. Um, uh, he's not taking eternity into account. But here's the part that is very helpful for us. Solomon does recognize one thing that is absolutely true. He's already said that the best thing that he can think of is for people to actually enjoy the things they gain through the toil in this world. And then he goes on to say that the ability to enjoy those things is a gift from God. And he actually puts it in a progression of, of three or maybe four expressions. He says that God must be the one first to give the wealth and possessions. You're not going to enjoy stuff that you don't have. So God's got to be the one to give it to you. And then God must also give the power to enjoy those things. 
So it's not just about having them. Having them is not a guarantee that you're going to enjoy them. And if we think about our own lives and certainly what we see in our world around us today, that's very, very apparent. Just having the stuff does not mean you're going to have a happy life. So Solomon rightly points out that God must give you the wealth and possessions or whatever it is, but God must also be the one to give you the power to enjoy those things. And God must be the one to give you the ability to accept your lot in life and to actually enjoy these things. This is the gift of God. And that is absolutely correct. Now, unfortunately, Solomon hits on this truth, but considering what he wrote just before this and the conclusion that he writes after it, Solomon's perspective is still quite limited. I want to take you beyond his limited perspective to see the real joy, but he does have a he does hit on the, the part of it here, but unfortunately, again, considering this gift, Solomon concludes, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart, which is a really awesome thought and what I want to focus on because there's so much joy in it, but let's please understand where Solomon is actually coming from here. We have to look at this in the context of everything he is saying, especially what comes right before and right after it. And what Solomon is saying is that it is a good thing. It is a gift of God when God gives you the ability to enjoy what you're toiling for. But in Solomon's perspective, the reason why that is a good thing is because God is essentially distracting you from realizing how short your life actually is and that death is coming. (laughs) He's still on this idea that death is coming. You keep on reading the next chapter, the conclusion at the, the end of chapter six is once again just that utter despair of we don't know what's gonna happen. Eternity isn't really there in his mind and it all just comes to nothing even despite this kind of bright spot talking about God's gift of helping you to enjoy things. Okay, from from Solomon's perspective here again, which does not include anything that affirms eternity or ultimate salvation, the best thing you can hope for is that God will give you joy in your heart day by day, which distracts you from the fact that death is drawing ever closer. And that is a really sad conclusion to come to. And thankfully, it is a wrong conclusion. It is the, the, the gift that Solomon hints at here. The reality of that gift is actually far greater than what Solomon's limited perspective is allowing him to come to conclusion concerning. Okay, because uh, we take the part that Solomon says that here is that's correct, but we need to understand that God provides far more than just a distraction. Okay, because it is a great gift of God, a gift we ought to seek each day to just do our work and reliance upon the Lord, whether that work is literally, you know, work at a place of employment or work in our home or whatever other activity we might engage in to do all of that for the glory of God. And if we do that, as I mentioned toward the conclusion of Sunday's sermon, if in all of that we make the Lord himself the delight of our hearts, then you Yes, we can expect that the Lord will give us himself and he will give us the gift of keeping us busy with joy in our hearts because in all that we do, all of our toil, all of our work, all of our attention, all of our goals, it's focused on him and he will give us himself. And and, and it is a wonderful thing to not pay much attention to the passage of time, to not think back longingly over days long past, wishing we could get them back, wishing we could turn back the clock. And that's what the vast majority of the world does, isn't it? After a certain point, birthdays become traumatic because you can't help but realize that time is flitting away from you. You're no longer as young and beautiful and healthy and capable as you once were. And we can so easily live in the past or we live for the past because of these forlorn thoughts about the passage of time. But what a gift of God for his people to be so caught up in serving him, in delighting themselves in him, that the passage of time really doesn't matter because the Lord himself is our desire, not the stuff of this world. That's what Solomon was 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 missing. Yes, it's it's great when by God's grace he blesses us with material possessions and enables us to enjoy those things. But even if all those things 
pass away, even if all of those things are ripped away from us like they were for Job, well, the people of God ought to still be kept active with joy in our hearts because our ultimate desire is God himself. And really the passage of time, far from removing us from the things we want to hold on to, the passage of time actually propels us toward receiving the fullness of what we truly want, which is to see God himself, to see him in his glory, and to enjoy him in that glory and majesty. And so this is my even more specific prayer compared to what I hoped for on Sunday or what I expressed on Sunday. It's that each one of God's people wherever they may be, but certainly here in this local body of believers here in Douglas, Massachusetts, that our desire would be to live each day with joy in our hearts, but that it would be a joy gifted by God to us, not just so that we could enjoy the physical things we have, our houses and hobbies and earthly goals and pursuits, but that we would be kept busy with joy in our hearts because God is himself the very source of that joy because he is the very target of our affection. He is the one that we want, that he and our, that relationship with him, that connection with him, that submission to him to have all of his goodness heaped on us through the understanding and learning of his word, his truth, that all of that would be the thing we're looking to gain for ourselves, which means we receive it as we seek him. And whatever we might have in this life, no matter how long our lives might be or how quickly the days seem to pass, it's true none of that would really matter because we're kept busy with joy in our hearts because we have the absolute certainty that even as time passes, it's only bringing us closer to the absolute desire of our hearts, God himself in his glory. I love you guys. I pray you have a good and godly day. And Lord willing, I'll see you soon.